really scary because to me it seemed like he was having some kind of seizure. I looked at him, but he didn't look like he was looking at me. He looked like he was looking up. I asked her, is this serious? And she said to me, we need this to be taken care of right away. Why her? Why not me? We didn't want to find out the diagnosis at the autopsy. One by one, they came into the room and said, I'm sorry, I have no idea what is happening to your child. Next, two medical mysteries that defied the experts. Since the day he was born, Landon Withrow has never looked his parents straight in the eye. Little do they realize his bizarre upward gaze is just the first in a series of harrowing symptoms that may cost him his life. Every day I would think, okay, this is as bad as it gets. The next day would top it. I felt like something was killing my child. Then, when Cindy Weber notices a bruise on her leg, she doesn't think much of it until it mysteriously begins to reappear again and again and again. I was in excruciating pain. It felt as if my body was surrendering to this disease. When illness strikes, we look to doctors to give us answers. But what if they can't? For these unlucky patients, diagnosis is a mystery. In the fall of 2000, Jonathan Withrow walked into the first class of the year at Middle Tennessee State University and saw the prettiest girl he'd ever laid eyes on. It was love at first sight. We worked on several projects together and we just got to know each other that way. Her name was Deanna Wilson. It only took him about two weeks to profess his love. It took me a little longer, but when he knows what he wants, he sticks with it. And two and a half years after we met, we got married. Although eager to start a family, the couple's priority is getting through school. We always knew that we wanted to have children. We were doing everything right that we were supposed to do. Go to college, save money, get a house. While things seem to be falling into place, the young couple gets some surprising news. They're going to be parents sooner than expected. When I found out Deanna was pregnant with Landon, we were just overwhelmed with joy. There were a lot of things that I wanted to be in my life, but being a mommy was something that I had to do. The next nine months fly by, and on November 3rd, 2006, Deanna and Jonathan welcomed their son Landon into the world. When they finally put Landon in my arms, it was so surreal. It was incredible. I can't explain it, only somebody that's had a child knows that moment. But within minutes of giving birth, Deanna notices something strange about her son. I looked at him, but he didn't look like he was looking at me. He looked like he was looking up. The doctor really didn't seem alarmed at all by it. It was just something he was going to outgrow. They would say that it takes time for some children to gain control over their eyes. Feeling reassured, the Withrows take their son home, and for the next several weeks, all goes according to plan. But just a few days before Landon turns a month old, everything changes. He woke up and he was vomiting and throwing up everywhere. I'd never seen a baby throw up this much. I was holding him and he would arch his back and clench his fists and curl his toes under. This episode went on most of the night. Hours of him coming in and out of screams and, and clenching and stiffening and me trying to come up with ways to console him. And it, it felt like it lasted forever. It was very hard. To see my son like that, I looked at him and thought, something's just not right. Sorry. We took Landon to his pediatrician the very next morning, and I told the doctor about Landon throwing up. And the doctor looked him over, did the exam. The doctor said that it was reflux, and um, that it was very normal, and not to be concerned about it, that he would outgrow it. The diagnosis comes as a relief to the worried parents. But the very next day, 
Landon has another fit, and then another, and another. After this, it didn't stop. There were more episodes, and they were more frequent. And it got to the point where they were happening at least once or a couple of times a day. Um, and that's just the really bad, the stiffening and the arching and the throwing up and the eyes way up. Every day I would think, okay, this is as bad as it gets. The next day would top it. He screamed like he was on fire. I am a nurse myself and this was something I'd never seen before. I had no idea what was happening with Landon. I was actually very scared. I did anything and everything that I could think of. I gave him gas drops. I tried to feed him. I rocked him in every position that I could think of. Nothing was working. Nothing. Not being able to comfort him was pretty hard. You really want to be there for your son. I got to a point where when he was going through this, I'd just tell him that I was just going to go through it with him. Because if I couldn't, if I couldn't stop it, I would just tell him, I'm here with you and we'll just get through it together. After three weeks of watching Landon suffer, the Withrows are at their wits end and decide to get a second opinion. I explained to the doctor what had happened and I mentioned to the doctor that his eyes during this episode that they went way up. I said, is this normal? Is a child supposed to look up like this? But nothing could have prepared Deanna for the doctor's response. The doctor mentioned autism. My mind just raced with all the possibilities. Autism is a complex developmental disorder in which individuals experience problems processing sensory input and communicating with others. Most telling to the pediatrician, however, is the fact that autistic children often avoid eye contact. That was the first time I really felt like, okay, this could be really bad. This could affect everything. This could affect him for the rest of his life. Although autism ranges in severity and can be treated with behavioral therapy, there is no cure. Deanna called me one day and she was crying and she said, Mom, she said, I'm afraid that Landon has autism. This is not fair. This just isn't right. I said, Deanna, there's no way to determine at this age whether he has anything like that. And I'm pretty sure that that's not what's wrong with Landon. If it wasn't autism, then I just wanted to know what it was. I felt like something was killing my child. Deanna and Jonathan Withrow are convinced something is very wrong with their six-week-old son, Landon. His eyes are fixed upwards, and he has daily episodes of screaming and vomiting. And while his doctor suspects he's autistic, the Withrows are dubious. I said, I don't think that's autism. Children develop at different rates. I said, just give him a couple more weeks. Maybe he's just a little slow. But as the weeks drag on, Landon's fits only seem to be intensifying. His episodes continued to get worse, and he would be in it a little bit longer than he was when he was younger. It was very scary for Deanna and I. I'd go from wondering, oh my gosh, is he, is he okay? Is he going to die? Should I take him to the emergency room? And we did this all day, every day. And just when the Withrows feel like they can't go on another minute, a new development stops them dead in their tracks. Just totally out of the blue, he looked me straight in the eye and smiled. He looked like a normal child. I almost couldn't even believe that it was happening, but it only lasted for about 30, maybe 60 seconds. I was really astounded. I thought, well, maybe, you know, he's getting better and, and going to outgrow this. I knew that he had the potential to be a normal child. Hope came back into the picture. Over the next several days, Deanna and Jonathan watched Landon closely, praying he'll lower his eyes again. It didn't happen again for a good few days, and then he did it again. And it was just as incredible as the first time, and reassuring that, yes, he can do this. And then 
After that, again, a few days, a short window. Those little windows were like little miracles. But despite Landon's improved eye contact, his screaming fits continued to escalate. It was really scary because to me it seemed like he was having some kind of seizure. We had been trying to find a pediatrician that would listen to us and would do something. I needed a doctor to see what we had been seeing. Determined to get to the bottom of Landon's bizarre episodes once and for all, Deanna takes her son into the emergency room. We went in, and when the pediatrician saw him, she was immediately alarmed. Landon started throwing up, and there we went full-blown episode. His eyes were so far up, there was no sign of his personality anymore. It wasn't Landon. Landon was trapped in his own body. The doctor took one look at Landon with his little fists all balled up and his toes curled under and his jaw clenched together and said that we needed to be admitted to the hospital immediately. Although she's not completely sure, the doctor has a hunch about what's been happening to Landon all along. The doctor was mostly concerned Landon had epilepsy. I really felt like maybe he did have epilepsy because to me it always seemed like he was having some type of seizure and that would make a lot of sense the way it would come and go. To determine whether Landon is having epileptic seizures, the doctors will need to monitor his brain on an EEG while he's in the throes of an episode. When I found out that they were going to do the EEG, I was scared. That was a very hard experience for both of us, just because I think it's such a traumatizing experience for such a young baby. They don't know what exactly is going on. At this point, I just wanted to know what it was. If they proved that it was epilepsy, then we'd deal with it. Sure enough, the next day, Landon has a violent episode of screaming and vomiting. But the EEG results leave doctors with more questions than answers. The EEG didn't really conclude anything, so we were kind of back at square one and not knowing what's going on again is more frustrating than knowing. Okay, it's not epilepsy, what is it? And that was when the parade of doctors began. One by one, they came into the room and said, I'm sorry, I have no idea what is happening to your child. I've never seen this before. It was very frustrating for Deanna and Jonathan because they really needed for someone to say, this is what's wrong with Landon. I was irate. I was so mad that they couldn't do anything. They couldn't do anything. My worst fear was he'd eventually die. For the last four days, Landon Withrow has been in the hospital, and over 20 doctors have tried to figure out what's wrong with him. Plagued by a bizarrely fixed upward gaze and screaming fits that look like seizures, the four-month-old seems to defy diagnosis. They didn't really know what was going on with him. I remember shaking my fist at the doctor saying, do something, can't you do anything? Then, when she least expects it, the lead doctor takes Deanna aside and drops a bombshell. The doctor said, I am sorry. Every once in a while, we get a child and we just have no idea. I did ask him, can you tell me if Landon will live? Do, is there any risk of him dying? Should we be worried about that? And his answer was actually, I don't know. So Landon was discharged from the hospital. We left that hospital and went home. I'd never felt so alone. Getting discharged from the hospital at that point was pretty tough. It almost like you walked out of there just not knowing what to do or who to go to. Over the next three months, the Withrows do their best to manage Landon's frequent episodes. But they can't help but notice that their son is also failing to hit nearly every one of his developmental milestones. The older he got, you could just tell he was getting further and further behind. He couldn't play with toys like typical children could. He couldn't roll over. He didn't crawl. It just took so long for him to do anything. We continued to see a geneticist and a neurologist, but the doctors really didn't have any solid ideas. There was always this little voice in the back of your mind that says, what if he doesn't walk? What if he doesn't run? What if he can never hold a pencil? It was hard to have faith all the time. 
I was worried if he could go to school like a typical child at all. I worried that he might never get to live his full potential because of his physical limitations. After seeing so many different doctors, I was fed up. I was just frustrated. I was angry and determined to find out what was causing Landon to do this. At the end of her rope, Deanna decides to take matters into her own hands. She would spend hours upon hours at night trying to find an answer to what was going on. And just a few weeks into her research, she comes across a website that stops her dead in her tracks. I stumbled upon the word upgaze and I found a video of the little boy and when I saw that kid and his face and his little eyes looking straight up, that was my kid. I was in bed and Deanna got me up to look at a video online uh, about a boy named Danny. I thought maybe this, this could be what was going on with our son. The doctor who diagnosed the boy in the video is Dr. Harry Chugani of the Children's Hospital of Michigan in Detroit. I sent Dr. Chugani an email. He wrote me back. Dr. Chugani really wanted to see Landon in Detroit. Next thing I knew, we were sitting in his office. I gave Landon the usual uh, neurological examination that most pediatric neurologists would do. I examined his eye movements, I examined his muscle strength. My first impression was that this was uh, a condition that I had seen uh, at least one other case. And that was a case uh, of a child called Danny. Dr. Shigani said, once you have seen it in one child, it's very easy to recognize in another child. My diagnosis for Landon was a rare condition called a paroxysmal tonic upgaze. Paroxysmal tonic upgaze, or PTU, is an extremely rare neuroophthalmological disorder in which the eyes focus upwards involuntarily. In a healthy individual, chloride ions transmit vital information from one part of the brain to another, including the signals that regulate vertical eye movement. But in patients like Landon, Doctors speculate the brain loses its ability to control these ions, and the eyes remain fixed in an upward stare. We don't really know why this happens. This is a very rare disease. There's only been 40 or so patients described. After Dr. Shigani was able to diagnose him with this condition, we just took a big sigh of relief. There was a part of me that said, okay, now he's got a diagnosis. How is that going to affect him? What is his life going to be like? Deanna and Jonathan Withrow have just learned that their 18-month-old son is suffering from paroxysmal tonic upgaze, a rare disorder that causes his eyes to stare up at the ceiling most of the time. I was so excited to finally know what Landon had after all of this time. It really made sense. It just fit. Dr. Chugani now believes that what looked like seizures to some of his doctors were actually byproducts of Landon's PTU. Landon would uh, tense up. His body would be rigid and he would have fisting of his hands and curling of his toes. They could be due to frustration as he is trying to break that uh, upward gaze. I don't think this is a specific symptom of PTU. But given that scientists understand so little about the disorder, Dr. Chugani can only speculate about Landon's other symptoms. Landon would have episodes of vomiting. I suspect that this might be related to the fact that his eyes were forced upwards, he was struggling with it, and this whole thing might have made him kind of dizzy, and that could explain perhaps the vomiting. And while he can't say for sure, Dr. Chugani believes Landon's developmental delays may also be linked to the disorder. In PTU, there's usually a loss of uh, control of the motor movement and speech centers. We don't really know the underlying mechanism. While the Withrows are completely overwhelmed by the fact that so little is understood about the condition, they can't help but wonder why it took so long for doctors to arrive at a correct diagnosis. I don't believe that PTU was really overlooked. I think physicians noted the unusual eye movement. I just don't think they were familiar with the rare condition. Unfortunately, 
there is currently no cure or treatment for PTU. There's not really a medication Lana can take that's going to cure the, the disease. But Dr. Chigani is hopeful that Landon's eyes will eventually correct themselves. The symptoms with PTU do tend to improve with age. At least the eye movement abnormalities tend to improve. Most of the cases that have been described uh, show that there is improvement of their symptoms by the time they're four or five years of age. Today, Landon's almost three and his eyes are already improving. He's able to control his gaze for even longer periods of time and consequently has made a number of developmental strides. Every day, Landon does something new and we can see him coming out of it and we can see it going away. And it's, it's awesome. It's phenomenal. We are all really thrilled with where he is right now. <laughs> Unfortunately, Landon's PTU continues to give rise to both physical and mental delays. Landon doesn't speak yet. He makes babbling sounds, but there really isn't speech. So he's quite delayed at age three. He's been army crawling for probably six or eight months at least now, if not longer. As far as walking, he's still not able to do that. To help him get around better, Landon has recently learned how to use a wheelchair. He did really well with it. It's his little go-kart. And uh, it's nice because mentally, emotionally, Landon is a very typical toddler, and toddlers like to move. I hope that one day Landon has no physical limitation. I know that he is a very smart little kid, and I just want him to be able to reach his full potential. I feel like he'll be able to one day go to school, be able to hang out with his friends, play some sports. But overall, my main goal is just to see him be just like any other normal child. While Deanna Withrow knew there was something wrong with her son from the moment she laid eyes on him, Cindy Weber didn't even realize she was in danger until her disease was already spiraling out of control. In the spring of 2004, Cindy and Bruce Weber were only a few years away from celebrating their 25th wedding anniversary but they were still very much in love. Cindy and I met in a ceramics class at the University of Illinois. He's my college sweetheart. I was a sophomore and there was an attraction right away. Cindy's my better half in the sense that she's very driven and she looks ahead a lot more than I do. Over the years, Cindy's high energy has come in handy, raising two children, working as a kindergarten teacher, and sticking to a daily exercise regimen. We were a very active family, and I loved to run, usually about three miles each and every day, and I loved to garden. I was an extremely healthy person. In fact, I was so healthy that I really rarely saw a doctor. But then, one afternoon in March of that year, Cindy spots something unusual on her right leg. At the end of the day, I noticed I had a three by five inch bruise on my leg. What was odd about that was I couldn't really put any specific thing to what would have caused such a large bruise. We'd always joke that she bruised very easily, so it wasn't a surprise. I wasn't too alarmed about that bruise. What was odd about it, though, was it was seeming to take a really long time to fade away. But then again, I really had never thought, how long does it take for a bruise to go away? It takes a strangely long time, two months in fact, for the bruise to fade. And even after it does, Cindy's left with an odd sensation in her leg. It still had the tenderness one would have with the bruise. I could always feel it, even when I couldn't see it. I did have a few friends who had had some serious illnesses, and I know that they had had some bruising. Just to play it safe, Cindy makes an appointment with her family doctor. So there I am explaining to the doctor, pointing to my leg, which looked totally normal. But I kept telling him, well, it still feels like a bruise. He said perhaps an MRI would be a good idea. Sure enough, the MRI reveals inflammation deep in Cindy's leg tissue. A sign, the doctor says, that the original injury hasn't completely healed. When he told me it was a deep tissue bruise, I felt a sense of relief. So it seemed almost to be the end of the story. The doctor advises Cindy to stop running and rest until the inflammation goes away. 
They suggested that I just be patient, that I should stop and give it time to heal. I hated to stop running. It was my stress outlet and it was something that I just enjoyed immensely. Reluctantly, Cindy follows the doctor's orders. But two weeks later, not only is her leg still sore, but the bruise has returned. It was very, very red and very blue. It was every bit as bold as the first time I had noticed it way back in March. This was very puzzling to me. So I made a call to the doctor. And the doctor told me to be patient. Maybe just hadn't been enough time. But as the weeks go by, a bizarre pattern sets in. The bruise mysteriously vanishes and reappears with no apparent warning. It would come and go. I might not have it in the morning. I might have it at night. I might have it one day, and then not again for three or four of my days, sometimes even a week. Sometimes it would just be very faint, barely visible, and sometimes it would be bolder. Amazingly, a whole year later, there's still no let up from the bizarre recurring bruise. But just as Cindy's resigned herself to living with it, she's blindsided by a frightening new symptom. It was the end of May and we were winding down the school year. The morning was fine, I didn't feel any different, and even at lunchtime I didn't feel any different. An hour before the end of the school day, I felt a huge wave of pain come over me. I felt all fevery. Lifting my pencil felt as if I was lifting a 50 pound weight. And every mark that I made on the paper, I felt a wave of pain go through my arm. When I stood up, I realized it wasn't only my arms, but my legs were in extreme pain as well. Somehow, Cindy manages to get through the rest of the day and drag herself home. I was out of town on a business trip and I got a call from Cindy and uh, she was crying that she was in so much pain. I knew I just needed to get to bed as quickly as I could. I went upstairs and it took me quite a while to get up the stairs because I was in such pain. I tried to put my pajamas on and I realized I could barely lift my legs. It felt as if somebody was hitting me with jackhammers in my knees. I was just miserable. Forty-four-year-old Cindy Weber has just experienced a strange and agonizing sensation in her legs, unlike anything she's ever felt before. I had pretty much decided if I wasn't better that I was going to the emergency room if I needed to. But when I woke up the next day, amazingly, all of the pains were gone. I felt pretty much like my normal self. Perplexed, yet thankful to be rid of the pain, Cindy returns to work the next day. But it isn't long before she finds herself grappling with an entirely new problem. I noticed a little line of red dots. I thought it was pretty unusual. After I discovered these little bumps, I went to my mom's house. But I particularly like to go with my medical issues to her because she's a retired nurse practitioner. And when Cindy's mother, Charlene, gets a glimpse of the strange dots, she's completely taken aback. I said, that is a petechial rash. And it has to be addressed, and it has to be addressed immediately. Petechiae are pinpoint-sized red dots caused by broken blood vessels under the skin's surface. The only thing that I could think of is, is that pe people who have blood disorders get petechiae. I could hear my mom's voice change its tone. And she doesn't always hide her emotions really well. She wasn't very calm about it. She said, you need to be seen now. And I said, Cindy, please call a physician and do something about it immediately, which she did. I was expecting that the doctor would know just what it was. But that wasn't what happened. When the doctor saw the rash, she was a little bit alarmed herself. I asked her, is this serious? And she said to me, we don't know what you have. We don't know if it's serious or not, but we need this to be taken care of right away. They started talking about what it could be. There were diseases like leukemia or lupus. The doctor performs a series of blood tests and a skin biopsy. And for the next three days, Cindy and her family wait anxiously for the findings. 
the test results couldn't come back soon enough. It was getting so frustrating. But when the report comes back from the lab, it reveals nothing out of the ordinary. My family had a sense of hopelessness, that they couldn't do anything for me. To make matters worse, Cindy's leg pains return with a vengeance. But they soon begin to radiate through her entire body. And just like the bruise, the episodes seem to come and go. She'd get up in the morning and she'd feel great. And then, say, midday, she would start to feel achy again. And then at night, it would, it would get worse. And the pains became more severe, to the point where she was having a difficult time walking upstairs or moving around in her kitchen. I was getting sicker and sicker by the day. I was hoping so much that it was just going to be some kind of a simple thing. Determined to find out what's been making her so sick, Cindy visits one specialist after another. I went to the regular doctor and an ENT, a rheumatologist, a dermatologist, and a neurologist. I kept thinking, well, maybe this will be the one that has the cure. Maybe this will be the one that knows what I have. But none of the doctors can explain her seemingly unrelated symptoms or keep them from getting worse. The pain got bad enough that she couldn't comfortably walk. She had to hang on to things in order to move around. Feet were, were really hypersensitive to anything. She felt like her feet were actually on fire sometimes. By the middle of the summer, nearly 16 months since the bruise first appeared, Cindy is completely debilitated. I could barely stand. I had such intense pain. I couldn't sleep. Even having the sheet on my feet was painful. It was shocking to see how fast she could go from really healthy to uh, really in, in just an agony. I was so sick that I wasn't able to care for my family anymore. I couldn't stand cook dinner or do any of the things that moms normally do. It was a devastating time for the whole family at this point. I think it was maybe uh, our darkest time. We didn't want to find out the diagnosis at the autopsy. I saw her deteriorating to become almost immobile. I thought, why? Why her? Why not me? For nearly 16 months, Cindy Weber has been suffering from a bizarre constellation of symptoms which have left her completely debilitated and in near constant pain. Over a dozen doctors have tried to find an explanation, to no avail. It seemed as if each day this disease was taking over my body in a bigger, stronger way than the day before. I was beginning to wonder if I was going to win the war. It felt as if my body was surrendering to this disease. Then, in June of 2005, Cindy goes to see her gynecologist for a routine checkup. But the visit turns out to be anything but routine. The doctor seemed to be very concerned. I had rashes on me, and I could barely move. The doctor performs a thorough exam, including a urinalysis, and discovers something alarming. Cindy has blood and a high level of protein in her urine a common sign of kidney failure. She decided that I should see a nephrologist as quickly as I could be seen. If my kidneys were involved, that may lead to a clue. Just 12 hours later, Cindy is sitting in the office of kidney specialist, Dr. Martin Kitaka. She brought in all her medical records with her. When I saw Cindy's urinalysis results and that in combination with her symptoms I began to think that she had a systemic disorder so I recommended to her that we do a biopsy of her kidney. I was pretty concerned because my kidneys were involved now. Deep down I was even wondering if this was going to be something that was life-threatening for me. A few days later, Cindy undergoes the procedure she hopes will finally give her some answers. It was a long weekend while we were waiting for those kidney biopsy results to come in. We were hoping so much that we were going to finally find out what was wrong with me. 
First thing Monday morning, the nervous couple makes the 20 minute drive to Dr. Kataka's office. Dr. Kataka came in. He told me that he knew what I had. The biopsy showed that Cindy has a disease called microscopic polyangiitis. Microscopic polyangiitis is a rare autoimmune disease in which white blood cells malfunction. In a healthy individual, the body produces white blood cells to help fight off infections. But in patients like Cindy, these same cells are defective and attack blood vessel walls throughout the body, causing severe inflammation. We don't know exactly why this happens, but there's some trigger that makes your immune system go haywire. Emotionally, I think having that diagnosis was very difficult for me. I had this rare disease. I had this disease that was not well understood by the medical community. There was all this new flood of, uh, of questions. But while the origins of the condition remain a mystery, Cindy's symptoms followed a well-documented trajectory. What one doctor thought was a deep tissue bruise was, in fact, the initial onset of the disease. The uh, bruising in Cindy was caused from inflammation of the small blood vessels within the skin. When that occurs, these blood vessels can rupture and cause leakage of blood into the tissue. And this can appear as a bruise. As her disease progressed, Cindy's malfunctioning white blood cells continued to multiply and eat away at her blood vessel walls, resulting in debilitating pain. When inflammation occurs in these blood vessels, that can cause leakage of blood into the tissue, but also narrowing of these blood vessels can occur, and that too can contribute to the muscle pains. Dr. Kataka goes on to explain that the petechiae that developed soon after Cindy's agonizing leg pain set in are classic signs of the disease. There's inflammation in the small blood vessels within the skin, causing leakage of blood into the tissue, and that can show up as these skin abnormalities. The disease is often unpredictable, but the manner in which Cindy's symptoms mysteriously appeared and disappeared doesn't surprise Dr. Kataka at all. Cindy's symptoms would wax and wane, and that's often the nature of this disease. And that's what makes it somewhat frustrating because for periods of time you feel better and then you feel worse again. But it was only a matter of time before the disease began to damage Cindy's kidneys, which explains her latest symptom, blood in her urine. When inflammation develops in these blood vessels within the kidney, that can cause leakage of blood and protein into the urine. Her kidney function was still perfectly normal. So what we were seeing are just very early signs that the kidney is being affected. Because I had good kidney function, they never thought to do the urinalysis. It's now all too clear just how lucky Cindy was to have received her diagnosis before the disease did any further damage. If Cindy had not been diagnosed, she could have developed kidney failure, respiratory problems, with bleeding into the lungs or through the GI tract. The condition can also cause blood vessels in vital organs like the kidneys and lungs to burst, resulting in a fatal hemorrhage. I was alarmed to find out that this disease can be quite serious. As Cindy struggles to grasp the gravity of her diagnosis, she can't help but wonder why Dr. Kataka was the only physician able to recognize the lethal disorder. MPA is considered a rare disease. One out of 100,000 people will get this disorder. MPA affects multiple organs, but sometimes patients only present with one symptom. So until they develop a constellation of symptoms, it's sometimes hard to diagnose. But even with a positive diagnosis in hand, the Webbers are devastated to learn that there is no definitive cure. The fact that the disease I had was rare, was potentially life-threatening, that it didn't have a cure, was very, very bothersome for me. The concern was, now we know what it is, but what's going to happen to me?
Dr. Kataka comes up with a two-pronged treatment plan to deal with Cindy's inflammation and her overactive white blood cells. The uh, treatment for Cindy involved using two drugs, prednisone and cyclophosphamide. Prednisone is a very potent anti-inflammatory agent, and both prednisone and cyclophosphamide suppress her immune system. Cyclophosphamide is also used in chemotherapy to kill cancer cells. Chemo drugs are serious drugs. On top of it, that particular drug has some significant side effects. Dr. Kataka told me that it was necessary, that I had a pretty serious disease. As long as Cindy is on the drug, her immune system will be suppressed and she'll be vulnerable to infections. In addition, the cyclophosphamide itself is so strong, it could do damage to healthy parts of her body. If the treatment didn't work, the worst case scenario is death. And there are other scenarios that could happen that I didn't like much better. You can lose your kidneys and have to have a kidney transplant. Most of the time we want to keep people on some medication for at least a year or two. But we need to watch her very carefully during this time. The good side was we have the diagnosis. There was the other side. What will the response be? I prayed with all my might that the treatment would work. And I was hoping that I was going to be one of those people, one of the lucky ones. Over the next six months, Cindy takes the potent combination of drugs every day. Cindy had an excellent response to these medications. Within a relatively short period of time, her uh, symptoms all gradually resolved as well. He told me that I had done extremely well, and he told me I was in remission. Of course, it was wonderful news. There was great joy in our house. Today, Cindy has been in remission for more than four years. My life has come full circle since all of this started. Today, Cindy is the person that we used to know before she got sick. Determined to make something positive out of her harrowing experience, Cindy has started a support group for people with her disease. What I would say to people who are in a similar situation to I was, that are ailing be your own advocate make those calls it's all about you and it's about saving your life and getting your health back into shape